Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Rollbar. Move fast and fix things like we do here at ChangeLog. Check them out at Rollbar.com slash ChangeLog. Resolve your errors in minutes and deploy with confidence. Catch your errors in your software before your users do. And if you're not using Rollbar yet or you haven't tried it yet, they want to give you $100 to donate to open source via Open Collective. And all you got to do is go to Rollbar.com slash ChangeLog, sign up, integrate Rollbar into your app. And once you do that, they'll give you $100 to donate to open source. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. Welcome to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific at changelog.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the show at changelog.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at JS Party FM. And now on to the show. Hello, party people, and welcome to another episode of JS Party, where every week we are having a celebration about JavaScript and the web. I am K-Ball. I'm your host this week, and I am joined by two of our regular panelists, who I'll introduce shortly. But first, we have an extra special guest today, uh, Chris Ferdinandi, who is often referred to as the Vanilla JS guy, or as he self-described himself to me when I asked... That jerk who argues with people on the internet. Chris, how you doing? I'm doing great, K-Ball. Thanks for having me on, man. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're super excited. And then our two panelists joining us again, we have Divya. Hello. And the one and only Nick Nisi. Hoi, hoi. You did it again. I love it. Wait, where's the accent? Where's the accent? Uh, hoi, hoi. Perfect. Okay, so having Chris on as the Vanilla JS guy, our topic for the day is, of course, Vanilla JS. Um, and a little bit of just like Chris. So Chris, can you kind of introduce yourself and tell us about all the different things you have going on? Yeah, there's um, just a couple things. Yeah, so I am, um, I'm a self-taught web developer. I started doing this actually right around the same time as Divya. Um, her and I met like right at the start of our respective careers at um, Artifact Conference in Providence, Rhode Island. Super awesome. And we're both speaking there, by the way, this year. So if you guys can make it out there, I highly recommend it. It's going to be awesome. But uh, yeah, I um, I started off my life as a developer knowing purely HTML and CSS and partially out of a lack of ability to find meaningful employment and also partially because as a self-taught developer, I didn't feel like a real developer because I didn't know JavaScript. I started teaching myself JS. And somewhere along the way, I transitioned from learning this stuff in jQuery to like wanting to really understand how it all worked under the hood. And then when frameworks started becoming more and more of a thing, I started feeling more and more like they were just making all this stuff way too complicated and just never like really dug that whole thing. No disrespect, Divya, because I know you're like all in on view. But um, yeah, so over the last five or six years, I've really kind of become a specialist on all things native, plain, out of the box JavaScript. And one of the things that I really struggled with early on was the fact that because it's not like owned by any one group or organization, there was no single source of documentation. Uh, the types of tutorials you'd find were varied in quality. And like a lot of times you'd have to cobble together your own comprehensive education from a bunch of different resources. Stack Overflow can be awesome, but if you're a beginner, they can be sometimes a little bit hostile to beginners and questions that are deemed too like obvious or entry level. Um, so I started creating educational resources to help other people who are going through the same thing. Um, it started off just me blogging about the stuff I was learning and eventually evolved into a daily newsletter, then a set of eBooks and video courses, and eventually a full on like eight week training program. Now I have this video subscription series thing I do um, where people can code along with me in real time and work on vanilla JS projects. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of fun. Um, I didn't expect this to turn out the way it did, but it's been kind of an interesting journey for me. Yeah, so you have, like I was looking at your portfolio thing, you have guides, you have a podcast, you have a newsletter, which I was a subscriber to for a while, actually, by the way, and then I stopped because I have too many newsletters. Oh, like, yeah, and the after a while, the daily volume can be, like, once you kind of know what you're doing, the daily volume can become a little bit much, so I, I totally get it. So 
is there a coherent strategy? Is it just all things vanilla? Like how is this intended to be a full-time business or this is a sideline? Like how are you approaching this? Yeah. So it's, um, it's all things vanilla. So there's not, um, there's not necessarily like a, a super focused, like I'm just going to double down on this one aspect of it. It's all of the pieces of vanilla JavaScript, but for me, always with a, an eye towards simplicity. Um, my primary audience is typically people who are early career developers or people who have been working on the web for a while, but as designers and are now looking to transition into learning a little bit of development. It is currently a side business. Um, it started off as one of those things where like I wrote a couple of things and I was like, oh, if I can make a couple hundred bucks off this, I'll feel happy. It is increasingly evolving into something that I, I hope will become my full-time job at some point. But yeah, for now, it's it's my side hustle. Awesome. And so you said we kind of got into the why behind mm -hmm. vanilla for you in terms of like getting frustrated with the levels of complexity and things like that. Is there, you know, from a sort of audience standpoint, from the folks who are out there learning, is there, there a reason why they should be focusing on vanilla JS? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a couple of things. So even if you eventually want to dig into a framework like React or Vue or it can be really helpful to understand kind of the basics of the language that those things were written in and how they work under the hood. I have a lot of students who tried to get into, and I think Vue is a little bit easier to just kind of start as a total beginner and get up and running with, but in particular React, which is kind of the, the beast to contend with these days. It can be really difficult for a beginner to like wrap their head around some of the paradigms and some of the core methodologies of how that framework works. And I've had a lot of students who have tried to do it gotten stuck and confused, stepped back, worked with me on building up their fundamental vanilla JS skills, and then got back to learn React and found that it was way easier to pick up. So, you know, if you're someone who thinks you want to learn a framework and you haven't yet, learning kind of the fundamentals will help you not only pick those frameworks up faster, but also write code with them better. So that's a big one. The other thing for me is even if you never want to go down the path of a framework, or if you're kind of debating, like, do I do a framework or not? One of the other big things for me, and Divya, you and I may have some kind of debates around this or possibly some interesting conversations, but I think there's an argument to be made around things like the performance benefits of not using a framework. I know a lot of times people justify using them because you get performance gains from things like the virtual DOM and some abstractions that they built in. But my argument is that in many ways, they actually hurt performance in some more meaningful ways, um, particularly when you're not working at like Facebook or Twitter levels of scale. I think there's an argument to be made that if you're using these in a team environment that can act as a form of gatekeeping that keeps either beginners or people whose core competency is not JavaScript from working with your code base in a meaningful way when they otherwise could. Uh, and then potentially, depending on what you're trying to do, they can actually introduce more fragility into the into the project. Um, I think a lot of times we turn to these tools to render markup when that markup would be just as easily rendered as markup on the server in the first place. And I know you can use some of these tools as server side templating things, and I'm cool with that. But I'm thinking more about like people use Vue or React to build a blog and like render the entire thing in the client. I think there's a pretty good argument there that that's better just served up as static HTML from the server. So I can dive into any of these topics if you want, but at a high level, these are kind of the things I think about when I'm talking about why I think vanilla is such an important part of the ecosystem. I think there's a really great article by Jeremy Keith where he, he makes a very similar point, which is the idea of JavaScript is not necessarily bad, but he's more an advocate for server-side JavaScript because essentially you would just like, from the server, you would do the rendering and then you're passing static like markup to the client. And so the client's not doing a lot of work um, and so from a performance standpoint, it, you get wins from that, but you also get the niceties of writing a framework because sometimes that's easy to componentize. It's easy to reason about for some people, for teams and so on. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds. <laughs> so you get the joy of like vanilla without having to write vanilla because you're still depending on a framework to do a lot of that work for you. And I thought that was like a really great in between, like to be like, you know, we're not totally saying frameworks are terrible, but we're saying that frameworks are bad if you put it like you depend on it to do all of your client side rendering. Because then in that case, it's just like for SEO, not great, <laughs> um, for performance, not so great and so on, which I thought was like a very salient point. That article is called The Split, by the way. So if anybody who's listening wants to go read it, um, it was a really, really insightful one. Yeah, and he he talked about a lot of the stuff you just you just mentioned, Divya. 
Jeremy also, this has kind of been his talking point for like, what, five or six years. I think the artifact you and I were both at, that was, the whole thing was resilient web design. And yeah, yeah, this is not, I'm not saying anything new. I'm just in many ways parroting what a lot of much more smart and seasoned people have, have already said. But, but yeah, so I don't know, is there any particular kind of angle you guys want to kind of dig into this on or anything I said that you disagree with? Well, I'm curious what you mean by vanilla JS, I guess, to start like, technically don't write JavaScript much anymore because, and I don't think a lot of people do because we're writing a lot of flavors of JavaScript. And that might be something that you're running through Babel to get you tomorrow's JavaScript. Uh, So it's not technically today, but like, what would you define as vanilla? Yeah. So for me, uh, I actually wrote an article about this not all that long ago because it is a little bit fuzzy. It's kind of, in the purest sense, it's literally just the native browser APIs and JavaScript methods that come baked in with the browser. But that almost implies that you never use plugins, never use helper functions, that you're hard coding every single thing you do over and over again. And that would be absurd. And so I don't think that's necessarily like a reasonable definition. It's in many ways a little bit of a like, I know it when I see it kind of thing. And I often prefer to talk about it in terms of what it's not rather than what it is. So For me, vanilla JavaScript is not loading large libraries like Lodash or jQuery. It is not using frameworks like React or Vue or Angular, but it could be using small helper functions. It could be using lightweight plugins that don't have any other additional dependencies or or third-party kind of integration requirements. It could even be, um, you know, doing things like using Babel to parse some more modern JavaScript into some older JavaScript or using something like Svelte or Hyper HTML to handle some of the rendering for you. And if you're not familiar with those tools, they do some of the stuff that React or Vue do, but they don't include a lot of the other stuff. Like they're purely focused on data reactivity and rendering, and they don't include a lot of the other helper methods and things like that. So they're a lot more lean. They weigh in at like somewhere between six and eight kilobytes instead of 30 gzipped and minified. Svelte is a really interesting example to dig into here, right? Because it has a lot of abstractions, but they're all compiled away, right? It's compile time abstractions rather than runtime abstractions. Yeah. And this is actually what Divya, the article Divya mentioned talks about this a little bit too, where there's two different types of code. There's the code that the cost is incurred by the user and the type of code where cost is incurred by the developer or the server beforehand. And Svelte clearly falls into the latter. SAS falls into the latter. Running React or Vue server side falls into the latter, where all of that that performance hit or all of kind of the the expense of using that tool is incurred not by the, like it never gets shipped to the client. And so, yeah, I think a tool like Svelte, you're right, it has a lot of abstraction in it, but what you're ultimately serving up to the client is vanilla JavaScript. Interesting. So that addresses the kind of performance overhead or overheads of that related to vanilla versus not vanilla, but it doesn't necessarily address the ease of entrance or the transparency, right? Because Svelte is... I haven't dug too deeply in Svelte, but it's going hard on the declarative component-based model and various other things that are not necessarily vanilla from a kind of conceptual entrance perspective. You're absolutely right. I was. To be fair, I don't personally use use Svelte. It's just not my ideal way of writing, developing code. I don't like a lot of kind of beforehand compilers. Honestly, I'm in many ways a developer dinosaur. Like my, my preferred way to work for the web is with a text editor and a browser. And I don't like a lot of tooling in the middle. But for folks who do, my biggest concern with the way we build for the web today is that we prioritize developer convenience over user experience. And that's not always the case. And I know there's kind of this weird argument that happens where like, if you make it easier for developers to build all these things, then they'll focus so much more on building all these great features for the user. But that's not really what often ends up happening. In reality, a lot of times you end up in this situation where JavaScript begets more JavaScript. And so we end up with these massive kind of behemoths that we have to manage and maintain and these crazy dependency chains that need to get constantly updated. So yeah, it um, and Jeremy talks about this in his article too, that I'm more comfortable with these tools because they don't incur any cost on the end user. But you do still have the gatekeeping concern where um, someone who's not comfortable working with these tools or these methodologies is going to have trouble accessing, you know, accessing the code base and working with the code base. 
So, I, yeah, that's kind of like a you're right, but um, I s- still am comfortable with them anyways kind of responses. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So it sounds like then to me, for you, the biggest thing about vanilla is actually about what's the cost to the end user. And the sort of entrance path ease of understanding is important, but maybe not your number one priority. Yes. I think it's a little bit of both, and a lot of it depends on the audience. But yeah, it is it is a bit of both. If I had to rank them, it's... Performance is part of it. Ironically, as a JavaScript educator, I spend a lot of my time trying to convince my students to write less JavaScript in the first place, too. So I am often lobbying for using more HTML, using more CSS, and using a lot less JavaScript. The talk I'm giving at Artifact in October is actually entirely focused on how we write too much damn JavaScript and we need to stop doing so much of it. It's kind of a weird thing to say as someone whose whole business model is built around teaching people JavaScript. But yeah, so for me, Villa is, Vanilla is as much kind of an overall ethos around building things for the web as it is a particular like approach to JavaScript development. Um, and not everybody will agree with that. But when I think about it, it's, it's about more than just JavaScript. I was just wanting to ask in terms of like, what are your thoughts towards... Um, like optimizations like prefetch and so on, which try to improve, which is like kind of the JavaScript world being like, let's have it all, like let's have our cake and eat it too so that we can make sure that we're not serving the entire bundle. We're kind of like serving whatever only needs to get loaded for that specific request and so on. Like, do you have thoughts on that process? And like, if it's useful and yeah. Useful, sure. Anything that speeds up performance for the end user is good. But I continue to believe that things like prefetch, uh, things like code splitting, even kind of this obsession with single page apps because you don't have to re-download all these files every time. Those approaches exist in large part because we've made our websites too bloated in the first place. And if the code bases were smaller to begin with, if they used a different approach to the stack, if they shifted more of that weight to less expensive parts of the stack, a lot of these tools and techniques wouldn't be necessary in the first place. So they can be great, lean on them when they make sense. But I would much rather as an industry, we spend more time talking about how we can write less JavaScript to begin with, how we can make the stuff we build more performant because we lean on the things that the browser is good at and stop throwing so much of the stuff that it chokes at, at it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm actually curious, like, going back to a previous point that you made, because you were were mentioning that we shouldn't lean on libraries like Lodash, and we should create, like, helper functions and so on. So those are great, but there might come a point where you might be rewriting a framework or rewriting pieces of a framework. Like, if you want state management, or if you want, like, something like moment.js or some like helper function in Lodash, you might end up having to rewrite it. So in terms of the, like, yes, you get the benefits of performance, but you end up doing a lot of work rewriting code that's already been done. No, because there's a caveat here. So I would not rewrite something that already exists in Lodash as much as I would shamelessly steal it from Lodash, like with proper credit and everything. But like, I see people load the entirety of Lodash for a single helper function from that library. And Lodash provides mechanisms for you to extract just specific or individual helper functions out of it. And I'm I'm totally cool with that latter thing. I have a problem with you loading the entire, not you specifically, Divya, but like I have more of a problem with loading the entirety of a library just to use one or two things. Like Back in the day, the joke was, you know, people would people would load jQuery just to like add and remove classes from a few elements in the DOM or just to get some elements and loop through them. And you don't need 30 kilobytes of JS just to do that. I'm comfortable with using third party tools. I just think we need to use them more responsibly. You mentioned moment.js, right? So there's um there's an alternative day.js that's only two kilobytes and has a lot of the same API. It's a little more feature light, but most people don't need the full feature set of moment.js. They only need a couple of couple of pieces of it. And so this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, like looking for lighter weight alternatives when they exist, creating some of your own when they don't, and just maybe being a little bit more responsible overall with how we do things. Like, it feels to me a little bit like web development is stuck in the Hummer days 
And do you guys remember when like the H2 Hummer was the status symbol car to have and all the like bros used to drive around them? And, and now like, you know, Teslas and Priuses are more a thing and people are a lot more focused on like minimizing their footprint. And it, it feels like web development right now is stuck in the like, we have all these big things just because we can. And I'd like to see us get to a more, I'll say environmentally responsible approach, both in the very literal sense, because there's a cost to hosting and loading and transporting all of these JS files. But just if you're thinking about the web environment and kind of the ecosystem in which users of the things we build have to operate, this stuff all comes with an expense for our end users. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned environmental cost because um, Alex Russell like wrote an article about the developer experience bait and switch. I where love he talks that about man. JavaScript. Yeah, he talked about JavaScript being carbon dioxide, <laughs> like the CO2 of the web, which is like a really nice, just like, but so in, in, in short, the whole vanilla JS is not so much about writing JavaScript, but it's more philosophy of how you approach web development to be more responsible about the, the things that you add to your project and making sure that's maintainable and so on. Yeah, I think it would be absurd of me to say you always need to write all of your own stuff and never rely on third party tools. And like, I don't do that. I certainly wouldn't expect you to do that. I don't think that's a reasonable thing to say. And some people do argue that. I, I think that's preposterous. But like, yeah, it's, it's about being a little bit more um, deliberate with your choices rather than just always grabbing the popular, large, off the shelf kind of stuff. So... I'm curious to play with that metaphor a little bit. So web development is stuck in the Hummer days. I guess thinking about what are the biggest frameworks, something like uh, Angular is probably the like H2, right? React and Vue, the H3, you know? Okay. And, and vanilla is a bicycle or like where are we at? It depends on the flavor of vanilla you're using. So um, It's a lime scooter. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's some sort of electric vehicle. Um you know, the other part of this is it's not just like, you know, so I've seen blogs that um, load basically nothing but HTML and CSS and maybe just a sprinkling of JavaScript for a little bit of like interactive pixie dust. I've also seen blogs that were built entirely on React. Like it's a static site, but the whole front end is running on React. And the if you're really straining this metaphor that JavaScript is the carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide of the web, then um, I think those two types of, or those two different ways of building the same thing have very different carbon footprints. And I've built entire, like the whole front end is driven by JavaScript before. So like my, when people buy my stuff, the guides, videos, things like that, they get access to this course portal where they can access their things, watch the videos, download stuff. The whole thing is JavaScript rendered. All of the markup is JavaScript rendered. And I can inline the entire CSS the base markup and all of the JavaScript to render all of the stuff, you just inline it in the HTML file and it gets served in a single 14 kilobyte HTTP request, um, minified and gzipped. So even though the whole front end is built in JavaScript, I'd argue that's still a much smaller footprint for the end user than if I had to load a framework to do that same kind of rendering. And that doesn't work for everyone and that doesn't work for all sites. And I totally get that. But yeah, there's kind of like a, a gradation here. I don't think there's any cut and dry, like that's bad, this is good. And I think you can make a clear argument that for certain large scale sites, using a framework does have some legitimate benefits. I think we lean on the idea that like, oh, at scale, at scale way too often. Um, I think a lot of the things people throw that argument at they're not really building at the kind of scale that these tools were designed for but um that's a different conversation This episode is brought to you by Linode, our cloud server of choice. It is so easy to get started with Linode. Servers start at just five bucks a month. We host changelog on Linode cloud servers and we love it. We get great 24 seven support. Zeus like powers with native SSDs, a super fast 40 gigabit per second network and incredibly fast CPUs for processing. And we trust Linode because they keep it fast. They keep it simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog.
Okay, welcome back to JS Party. Now let's talk about another kind of related topic. Chris, you're doing a lot of teaching. I know Divya, you've done a lot of teaching and, and stuff and you're involved in that. So let's talk about you know how to learn and how to learn JavaScript. And I think one fun place to start, uh, given we have the guy who argues with people on the internet um, and other things is you know kind of this argument about starting with a framework versus starting with fundamentals. Like it's it's very easy to just say, oh, you've got to learn the fundamentals. Um, that's kind of hard to argue against globally. But I think there are reasonable arguments both for and against what sequence you should do. So kind of let's let's throw that out to start. Um, start with you, Chris. You know, what are your arguments about what someone should learn first and why? Okay. So my general thesis here is that learning inertia is more important than doing things perfectly. And so I would much rather see someone use whatever approach gets them from, I don't know what I'm doing to I'm writing something that works and makes me excited to keep doing this, whether that's using jQuery, using a framework like Vue or working in vanilla. I believe that I can teach people how to do that with vanilla really quickly. In fact, for a while, I used to have this little, um, I can teach you JavaScript in 20 minutes kind of shtick where I would take you from knowing nothing to writing a working like little script in 20 minutes or less. But yeah, the for me, the biggest thing that kills learner motivation is trying to make something work and getting stuck and then not knowing what to do next. That's where most people give up. And I would much rather have you use jQuery or use Vue if that gets you going faster and keeps that momentum going if the alternative is you just quit. I'm totally cool with the idea that people can back into the fundamentals. And a large part of that is because I learned with jQuery. I could not wrap my head around vanilla. I learned with jQuery and then started doing the whole like, oh, if you do this in jQuery, you do that in vanilla mental map. And so I, I think it's totally fine if that's what people want to do. I probably am thinking people weren't expecting me to be so pragmatic about it. But um, I think there are some really good reasons to jump into vanilla first. But um, I, I certainly don't think it's required or necessary or even the best approach for everybody. I know some people get it right away. Some people find it really weird. I was just talking with someone this morning who she could not wrap her head around vanilla. She's been trying for weeks. And then she picked up jQuery and it instantly made sense for her. And so in her situation, I'd much rather she go down that path and keep at it. Well, that takes the wind out of my argument because you just echoed exactly what I would have said. You're not letting us argue here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could be more dogmatic about it. I think the big argument in favor of vanilla these days is that like five years ago, it was really easy to make arguments that it's really tough to do X, Y, and Z in vanilla. And, you know, it just, it doesn't work really well across different browsers. So having to juggle all these things, but I just, I don't, Unless you're using a lot of the cutting edge stuff, that's just not the case anymore. Um, you could argue that things like like query selector and query selector all are absurdly verbose. And I would say, yes, you're right, they are. But um, the power features are there and they work really well across the browsers that people actually use today. It's easy to get elements in the DOM. It's easy to toggle classes on and off. It's easy to get attribute values and set attribute values. The harder things are usually the things that the frameworks abstract today, like managing state-based UIs and dealing with data reactivity and that sort of thing. And for me, that's why, like, if you're going to learn and you need a tool to help you, I think a helper library is actually a better choice than a framework. Like, I don't see Vue, aid, no, no offense again, uh, maybe React's the better choice here, but like, I don't see frameworks aiding the learning process the same way that I see helper libraries aiding that learning process. For sure. I agree with that. And I, like, kind of parroting a little bit of what you said, like back in, back in the day, uh, when I was a webmaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, like a lot of things that like I would want to bring in like jQuery, not, uh, sort of jQuery, but I w the reason I would want to bring in something like backbone or something to, to work on, uh, an app is because I wanted that kind of, um, pattern and consistency that it would bring in. And it, like w the main thing that comes to mind is like, creating classes or doing object oriented JavaScript, you know, before ES 2015 and we actually had the class, uh, like sugary syntax, like you could be doing classes one way here and Dojo has a, a wrapper that lets you do it with, with, um, you know, multiple inheritance and backbone has their own way. And like, there was just so many different ways to do things, but that was a way to 
consolidate on a pattern and then use that throughout your code base. Uh, now we've kind of consolidated on the platform, which I think is much, much better, even though, you know, classes are kind of falling out of favor, which is probably a good thing. But the platform is catching up to where to what we need and meeting those needs. And anything that it's not like helpers are definitely a way to to go to to bring that in. I think one thing I find that's um, at, for having taught people who are new to development and so on, like a big part about frameworks is really is that the abstraction is really nice because you you can get going super fast. They can build something like incredibly complex looking without doing a lot. Something really complex with like multi page and routing and so on without knowing a lot, and that's super nice. And I think that gives. Like I found compared to when I teach like actual fundamentals, like it gives people that immediate like euphoria of like I built something and I was able to like do this without knowing a lot. Um, and the thing is, the, the, the issue there though is that oftentimes that abstractions kind of take away from the learning experience as well. Like it gives you that niceties of like, yeah, I built something, but then I always try to bring it back to be like, do you know what's actually happening? Um, and then kind of, showing the different steps of like, this is what routing is, this is what state management is, and so on. Which like, to me, and and I guess I'm speaking directly to like my own learning <laughs> and how I learn. And in general, I think when I've worked with students, a lot of them are in university, they kind of want to have that, like I built something like sense. Cause they're like, I don't have a lot of time. I have other classes, I have things to do. Um, and so like giving them that immediate satisfaction of I built this thing and then teaching them slowly how the things that the pieces fit together has been incredibly useful because then it makes things click a lot better because I'm like this is what a scope is and this is what classes are and these are why it's important because remember you used it here like this is exactly what's happening under the hood it's not always successful because sometimes people just don't care because uh, they're like the framework deals with it for me why should I care and then like making that argument is really hard to your point though Divya like a lot of learning material that I encounter tries to teach some of these high level concepts in the abstract. And it's really hard to make it click with people until they actually see it in action. So I think what you just described where you build this thing and then you back into how it's working under the hood. Um, I think that can be really, really smart approach. And that euphoria of making something that works out of nothing. Like I, my website is go make things. I love to make things, but I am really bad at building stuff with my hands. I suck at woodworking. I can't, you know, do plumbing or metal work or anything like that. But with web development, I can build stuff that actually does things. And it's really, really exciting and cool. And I remember the first time I got that, like, wow, I like, I, I took an empty document and made it do stuff. It's just, it's, it's a feeling that's like really hard to compare to other stuff. So yeah, anything you can do to get people like into that space quickly so they have that motivation to keep going is really important. Yeah, I think that approach that you see in like in old school movies like Karate Kid where they have to like he has to go through I mean it's obviously like sped up but you have to go through this process of like proving yourself and then you learn the fundamentals of like wax on wax off and you're like how does this relate to anything it's so old school <laughs> and like it just does not resonate with with students like or anyone really because you're like oh you have to learn all of these and like after a couple of years you'll achieve like you'll finally be able to build the thing and people just drop off after a while because they're like what's the point and that's frustrating. And so from a teaching perspective, it's really important to kind of get that hook of like, look, you built this thing. Now let's like move further and let's make that a little bit better. And let's like sharpen your knowledge of how the things work. How can you improve and so on, which like is just a really great way of achieving success and like encouraging people because it's really discouraging when people don't build anything and they're like yeah theoretically I know how the DOM works and like <laughs> how to write some basic JavaScript but like what's the point so talking about learning inertia then because I think a lot of this is coming back to this this kind of thing if you need some some movement you need some momentum um, what are the things that people are having trouble with that kind of stops that inertia in its tracks before we go down that path I just need to thank you for saying inertia so I, whenever I use that, people are like, you mean momentum. And I'm like, no, no, like in the physics sense, it is inertia. So thank you, K-Ball. I feel vindicated as a person. I feel heard. So thank you very much for that. By the way, my degree, I, I almost commented on this. 
I did not get a CS degree because my first CS course was exactly the terrible things y'all are talking about. My degree is in physics. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And I am such a, like, I love physics. I didn't, I didn't study it beyond like some high school and entry level college, but like, I just, that's awesome. Um, so, um, yeah. So interestingly, when anybody signs up for my newsletter, they get an email from me asking you know, what's your biggest challenge as a web developer? So I feel like I, I get a lot of responses back from people on this sort of thing. And there is a huge variety in responses, but there is one response that comes back more than any other. It's at least half the responses I get. And it's some variation of, I don't know where to start. I'm overwhelmed by the need to keep up with all the things or I don't know which framework to pick first or like there's this real pressure to like, feel like you have to like just constantly keep up with this absurd change of pace that we have in our industry. And it's one of those things that makes web development really exciting. If you're someone who thrives on learning lots of new things, this profession gives you an opportunity to never be bored. But it's also where a lot of the burnout comes from because people feel like they have to constantly keep up. And if you don't, you're going to miss some important boat and get left behind and your career will be terrible and no one will ever love you and you're going to die alone with your cats. So that is literally the number one problem that I hear from people. A lot of the other stuff is a lot more on the nitty gritty tactical stuff. So like things like, I don't know when to use prototypes or just kind of like these these really like minute details about like specifically when you should use one approach versus another. I'd actually love to dig in on this knowing what to focus because I, I also you know, survey folks on my newsletter about you know where your challenges are and, and things in front end development. And this is one of the number one challenges that people have is what should I be focusing on? How do I possibly keep up or how do I even make sense of where to start? And I have some opinions on that, but I, I would love to hear your opinion, Chris, but also from, from Nick and Divya, like, where do you, if somebody comes to you with that question saying, gosh, like, there's so much, where do I start? How do you even approach that? The thing is, and in a sense, the reason why I really love you <laughs> is because it's not much different from writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Like, yes, you have single file components. Yes, it like bundles into JavaScript and whatever, but um, from the core of it, you're still writing and something that you're very familiar with. And so if you've ever done any program, any like web design or development, it's not completely new. Um, and so for, like I start with that, that, cause I'm like, this is like your markup and this is your JavaScript. And often I don't even talk about the JavaScript aspect of it. I just talk about the markup and I'm like, here's where you write your HTML and like start from there and then you kind of build on like okay you want to make it interactive you want to make this button click and then you put like an on click handler which is not very different from doing in javascript <laughs> a little bit easier because you can just put like a at click and then like the the event method name versus like doing document.query selector and like whatever which is kind of annoying to have to write every single time jquery obviously makes it better <laughs> but i i usually try to start from building blocks that way and obviously like as i said super biased because i love you <laughs> um but for me it's a matter of just like making people understand like what these pieces are and then i also try to talk about the other frameworks and what they do because like often whenever i introduce view people are like what about react should i be learning react and i'm like well it depends on what you want to do it's it's a stylistic thing like ultimately <laughs> they bundle to like the same thing they do similar things they have virtual dom whatever it's like the same it's just like do you want to write jsx like do you want it more imperative do you want to write like your html css and javascript separately apparent this discussion is more like framework choice than anything and i'm like i'm teaching you view because i like it you can choose to use react it's just a different way of writing things you can even write view like react i can show you how to do that because that's possible there's a render function you can make it look exactly the same but um I think that's the core concept of it, which is just like understanding why you make decisions and being intentional about that. So like a something we talked about earlier, which is being intentional as a developer is like core to being a developer, just like understanding and reasoning about why you're making a decision. Cause it's like, it even starts like at the beginning of your career. Like, why did you pick a framework? It happens like whenever you talk to someone, whenever you're like, I'm a React developer, you're like, why are you a React developer? Or like, why did you pick this framework? And you have that, you have to know why and make decisions. And saying like, oh, because someone else picked it is not like 
kind of good enough in a sense. I guess it cuts it sometimes, but it's nice to be able to like have that opinion. And developers like are opinionated, so that's kind of like how I... I know of you because Divya told me to learn it. <laughs> the framework chose me. Yeah, the framework chose you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like arguably, I ended up writing a lot of Vue because um, I joined a company where they wrote Vue. <laughs> and so it kind of was like, it's something I've wanted to learn. And then I joined a company where I had to learn it. And then I learned it. And then I was like, oh my God, this is great. I used to write React. And I was like, this is way better. I love it. Um, I still like, you know, think React is cool and everything. But I think Vue is cooler. But that's, that's another discussion. I kind of approach this question from like, uh, a couple of different points or a couple of different viewpoints, uh, mostly like, is there something specific that you want to try and solve? And if there is, then you should try and just work towards that and just do not care if the code looks terrible. Uh, cause you can always go back and fix it later. Once you have something working, like you will calm down, you will be less stressed and you'll be able to go back and look at your code and tear it apart and understand it and, and go from there. If you're more talking about just learning something, uh, like learning JavaScript, for example, I, I tend to like pick things that are, are free. So you have zero investment to really get into it. So, uh, and that can depend on like how you actually learn. So that's probably something that you yourself have to answer. Do you learn best from a book? If so, maybe eloquent JavaScript, uh, would you rather watch video courses? Maybe West boss, if you have, but, but like the main thing that I would pick is something that allows you to learn a little bit and then try it and then fail and keep trying it. But like, not just like being lectured to for hours instead, you know, have a little bit of lecture or a little bit of reading and then go in and, and try and do something very small just to, to build that up and, and get that practice in. Nice. My background before I was a web developer, I was an HR guy who uh, used to work with software developers on career development stuff. And so I am, I have a little bit of a perspective here just because I've seen folks kind of go through this in my pre-developer life too. And I actually, I, I'll put this in the show notes too, but I wrote, um, I wrote an article about knowing what to focus on uh, some time back just because I get asked this so much. And for me, there's uh, like three or four kind of core things. Some of them, Nick and Divya, you, you both already touched on, but one of them, uh, Nick, I think this is a little bit like what you were just talking about, but it's uh, this concept of just-in-time learning. So this is a, this is a trick I picked up from um, Sarah Swidon whose name I almost certainly butchered. And Sarah, I'm so sorry. But uh, it's this idea that rather than trying to learn all the things just to keep up with all the things, I usually hold off on learning something new until it's required for a thing I'm trying to accomplish. So like, I didn't go out and learn Flexbox or CSS grids just because they're the new hotness and everybody is chasing after them. I went and learned those like probably a year and a half after a lot of people already knew how they worked because they helped me achieve a layout that I was struggling with otherwise. So they provided an advantage that they didn't before. Same thing goes for fetch instead of XHR um, for you know making a asynchronous JavaScript calls. XHR was serving my needs perfectly for a really long time. And then to be completely honest, when I went and learned fetch, I decided I liked XHR better and went back to it. This is why I still don't know Vue. Right? It's, it's one of those like, like a lot of these tools just, they, they either don't solve problems I don't have, or I'm just like, there's no need for me to know them yet. Um, I, I personally, one of the other reasons you could advocate for vanilla JavaScript first is that not that these tools ever really go away. Like there's still tons of places that build things with Angular, but you can see kind of the cycle of new hotness where Angular was like the thing. And then React came out and everybody's like, oh, forget Angular. React is way better. And then Vue came out and, you know, people like Divya and even myself, even though I don't use it, like I look at the docs and I'm like, this makes so much more sense. Like, or like, oh, forget React. Vue is, Vue is better. Um, and obviously React still has a pretty dominant place, but you can see Vue's market share starting to grow and grow and grow. And if you work primarily with vanilla JavaScript, there's never this new thing you need to ditch your old thing to learn. Like I'm just constantly entrenched in the fundamentals and I never have to think about how I need to build the thing I want to build. Not that I never have to think about how to build it, but like I've got this kind of this foundational knowledge that serves me well across whatever I try to build. Similarly, like this idea of stable technology over the new hotness, like the stable stuff is certainly less sexy, but it also potentially has more traction within a um, 
like kind of a working environment. Like companies don't want to use the new thing. They want to use the proven thing that they know is going to work for them. And so these days, Angular or React are good choices because a lot of companies use them, trust them. They've been around for a while. And, you know, in terms of like employment, I, I have this thing concept I call targeted listening. But like if there's a particular job you want, like I tell us a lot of times for like for beginner developers, like if you know you want to work at a certain company or there's a type of job you want to you want to do, talk to people who do that job. Look at job descriptions for the kind of roles you want. What sort of skills and technology are they looking for? If you want to go work somewhere that says they want React experience, to me, the no brainer is to pick React. Like dig into that, learn it, and then, you know, go interview for the job. When I was first interviewing for my first web developer role, I um, I was looking in-house at the company I was at, and I talked to the director of UX. I asked her very specifically how they were approaching responsive web design, and she told me mobile is a fad and one that I think is almost over. No one wants to do the thing that they built on their phones. And I literally immediately just ended the interview and said it wasn't a good fit and thanked her for her time and left because I, I knew that wasn't a good fit for me. I think kind of paying attention to bigger trends in the marketplace rather than just jumping over to the next new thing, like mobile and responsive web design represented a really big shift in the way that the industry worked. Whereas a lot of these frameworks are just tools to approach a particular set of problems in a specific way. But what they're all getting at is a bigger shift in the way that we build things with state-based UI and reactive um, data models and things of that nature. And so for me, kind of the specific tech choice there is less important and understanding kind of the shift in the way we do things is more important. And so I tend to follow some people on Twitter and by reading blogs that I think have a pretty good pulse on shifts that are going to happen in our industry. And when they say something's important to pay attention to, then I tend to pay attention. So like people like Brad Frost or Jeremy Keith, Ethan Marcotte, Sarah Swadon, you know, they're kind of my my compasses for when I should pay attention to something or not. I want to chime in just a tiny bit. You hit almost all of the points I was going to say, so I don't need to say very much. Oh, I'm so um, sorry, Cable. Oh, no, no. That's It's actually better. That's better that you say it. Because um, I, I harp on this a lot. People are probably tired of me saying this, but I think the last thing that you said there is really important, which is look at the bigger picture, not the micro picture. Look at what are the mega trends. And if you look at all of these things like Vue, React, Angular, they are all tapping into the same big trends and they are all using some of the same fundamental models. And you will be much better off just picking one and focusing on it and getting far enough on it that you can kind of understand those bigger picture questions than trying to spread your time. So you know, I see a lot of junior folks being like, okay, I have to learn some React and now I've got to learn some Vue and now I've got to learn some of this and that, some of that. And I think you, know, you are going to do yourself, both you'll be less stressed, but also you will learn better if you pick one and focus on it and go deep enough that you actually get a fundamental understanding of those bigger picture questions of how does, you know, what is good component design and how does that work? Um, you know, how does a front end app get architected? How are the different pieces fitting together? How do I deal with data flows and all of these different things? Like the details are in some ways only important as a way to get to the bigger picture and the understanding. Agreed. Guy Kawasaki tells this story that I'm going to bore you guys with right now, and I'm so sorry. But so he he tells the story of like, it's, it's literally the history of ice. And so back in the 1800s, you used to have ice harvesters. If you've ever seen the movie Frozen, this is what that opening scene is, where the guys are like cutting all the ice out of the, the frozen river and throwing it on a sleigh. And that's how people got ice for their ice boxes. They would haul it down from the mountains and drop it off at people's houses. And then eventually they figured out that you could manufacture it in these big factories. So they would manufacture it there and throw it on a horse-drawn cart and bring it to your house. And then in-home refrigeration came around and suddenly you didn't need any of these things because you just make ice in your house or keep your food cold. But the crazy thing is not just that these shifts happened, but that almost no one who was in the ice harvesting business jumped into ice factory making, ice factory manufacture. And nobody in the ice factory business jumped over into in-home refrigeration. They all missed these shifts that were going to completely change the way that their business worked and they died out. And so when I'm thinking about kind of what to learn and what to focus on, like my biggest fear as a developer and as someone who advocates for these simpler ways of doing things 
is, uh, and I'm probably going to undermine all of the points I made in this this conversation, but like my biggest fear is always that I'm in danger of being like that UX developer who said mobile's just a fad and missing out on some big shift in the industry that completely makes what I do obsolete. I'd like to think that's not true, but it's one of those things that I'm always just a little bit cautious of in the back of my mind. You know that that Simpsons gif about like, is it the kids, you know, am, you know, am I out of touch? No, it's the kids who are wrong. Like sometimes I feel like, I feel like that a little bit, you know, these, uh, these young whippersnappers like Divya with their view and their JSX. So uh-huh. anyways, I don't, um, I don't know if there was really a point to that. I just, I love that story. And it's like, it's just one of those, like for me, like focus on the big pictures, look for the trends and uh, make sure you don't end up being like that person who thought mobile was a fad. This episode is brought to you by Gage. Gage is a free and open source test automation tool by ThoughtWorks. The goal of the tool is to take the pain out of test automation and to help with this Gage supports specifications of Markdown, which are easy to read and easy to write, reusable specifications to simplify your code, which makes refactoring easier and less code means less time maintaining code. And finally, integrations. Use Gage with your favorite tools and your IDEs and the ecosystem of your choice. Selenium, Saihi Pro, CIC and CD tools like GoCD, Jenkins, Travis, and IDE support for Visual Studio, VS Code, IntelliJ, and more. Head to gage.org slash jsparty to learn more and give it a try. Again, gage.org slash jsparty. All right, for our closing segment, let us talk a little bit about our favorite vanilla JS tricks or APIs or, or that sort of thing. So it's kind of a shout out section, but specifically for vanilla JS. And so you could plug a particular API, a particular trick, a particular resource, however you want to go about it. And let's start out once again with our guest, Chris. So um, I have three. The first for me is. Um, Query selector and query selector all were like revelations for me. They're kind of old news at this point, but um, those two methods and kind of all of the other ones that rolled out at the same time brought this jQuery-like simplicity to vanilla JavaScript. And it was such a pain to try and select elements in the DOM before that. They made it so, so easy. And so those were like a real game changer for me. More recently, I had always kind of dismissed the array reduce method as this thing that you could use to like total some numbers in an array together and really not much else after that. Until someone explained to me that like the thing, and so for those of you who don't know, array reduce will take an array and all of the items in it and reduce them down to a single output value. It never occurred to me that the output value could be an array or an object or some other thing. And so I've now discovered that you can use array reduce to do these really complicated things that would have required chaining a couple of different methods together. And it can just knock them out in one fell swoop. And it's become this really powerful part of my toolkit that I really did not appreciate until I saw a few working examples of things you can do with it. I'll make sure I drop some of those in the show notes, but like a common example I like to use is if like if I had an array and all of the items in the array were objects that contained the names of wizards from Harry Potter and the house they were in. And I wanted to get back an array that contained just the names of wizards from the Hufflepuff house. I could do that by using array filter and then array map, but with array reduce, I can knock that out in one, um, just kind of in one operation. It ends up being about uh, twice as fast as doing it with two. And uh, you get some real nice performance wins there too. And so I'll, I'll drop a link into the show notes for how that works. Yeah, just a super powerful method that I never realized you could do so much with until a few months back. And then whenever people kind of harp on the whole, like, well, a lot of these newer methods don't work cross-browser. One of my absolute favorite tools in my toolkit is polyfills. Um, they're little snippets of code that bolt functionality into browsers that don't support things. So like if your browser doesn't support the closest method, you can polyfill it and it works everywhere. Um, And I used to like spend a lot of time checking what was in my code and dropping polyfills in. These days I use a tool called polyfill.io, which is the, um, 
FT Labs um, created project um, that they open sourced and provide for free. And it detects the browser the user is on and it sends them a bundle of polyfills, just the ones that are needed for their browser. So it's this really awesome tool. If I'm on Chrome, I get back nothing. Um, the latest version of Chrome. If I'm on IE8, I get back a bundle of about 15 kilobytes minified and gzipped of stuff. And you can use things like promises and older browsers and um, you know all of the new methods that wouldn't be supported in those browsers. So um, those are my three, um, just a handful of tools that I couldn't live without. Awesome. And on the array reduce thing, I think you've been reading some of the same stuff I have. Um, and actually one of the things I want to shout out, I'm just going to shout out a couple of authors uh, to read through. Um, though obviously another great author to read through on this is our guest, Chris. So if you haven't checked out his stuff, definitely check out his stuff. There will be links in the show notes. Uh, two in particular, and the one that that reminded me of is a gentleman named James Sinclair has been writing some incredibly good articles about uh, writing functional JavaScript and using things like Array Reduce. And I think the the example that you were describing now on Array Reduce was from an article of his in May about how to use array reduce for more than just numbers. Like he's been writing these incredibly uh, in-depth but also understandable articles that just reading them has upped my level of JavaScript and particularly functional patterns in JavaScript. Um, the other author I want to plug is a gentleman named Eric Elliott. Um, he has written a bunch of great stuff on Medium, uh, which I know the the hip thing now is to hate on Medium, but... Um, he has a bunch of good stuff on there. I think more recently he's been doing things like uh, crypto and all of that kind of crazy world. But um, looking back at you know his posts and digging through the stuff that he's written, there's a lot of great JavaScript stuff in there. So uh, those are my two quick plugs. They're both learning plugs. Um, but yeah. How about Divya next? Cool. The like going off of like medium and various people writing about JavaScript, I highly recommend Kyle Simpson's You Don't Know JavaScript. It's really, really good. Um, and a lot of the times, like, I mean, you think you're great at JavaScript and then you read his book and, and then you're like, oh, I actually don't know JavaScript. <laughs> and that's generally my experience every time. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know this concept, of course. Like, it's just going to be a reiteration of what I know. And then I realize that I don't actually understand it as well as I thought. I did, and it's a like disheartening, but also encouraging, because <laughs> it means that I'm always learning, and like it's always nice when I'm proven wrong, because it means I learned something new. I'm trying to take that approach, just like not n not to have my ego deflated or whatever, and just to be like, okay, I'm learning, and like this is good. Um, and then the next one is uh, this design patterns book called Learning JavaScript Design Patterns by Eddie Osmani. I think it was plugged by. Emma and I like back a couple of episodes ago, but I really like that book and I've used it like a lot. So before I got very deep into the framework world, I wrote a lot of vanilla JavaScript and I had to learn how to do a lot of like design optimizations and create like helper libraries and so on, which involved understanding how the like how to design my overall JavaScript because like writing JavaScript is one thing, but if you are organizing it that you want it another project to use it or you're organizing JavaScript in a wider project that you want to have like some kind of maintainability, you need to be able to organize everything well. So when you come back to it a couple of months later, you'll understand. And so that book was incredibly useful. I used it so much as a resource. I just kept coming back to it, just understanding like different patterns. Um, like the revealing module pattern is the one I use a lot, but he talks about different other design patterns. Um, like the singleton and whatever else, which is actually really nice because there's some like computer science ness to it, but it's directly applicable so you don't feel like you're completely stuck in theory because there's clear examples of how exactly to implement them and why they're useful, which I think is like amazing. And then the last thing is like, of course, Artifact Conf. It's great. I love it. I was there like like Chris was mentioning back when I was starting my career-ish, like I just graduated from university and I was like trying to get professional. Well, actually I might've been in university trying to get, pro whatever, I don't remember. But <laughs> I do, you were still, you were in your final semester, I think, Divya. Um, I think, yeah, I think something like that. And then I like got my first gig at Sparkbox, which was great. So yeah, like Artifact Conf is great. 
uh, you never know. You might find like a good network and like get your first job. Yeah, Artifact got me my first job too. Yeah, it's so great. Awesome. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great conference. Um, it's a really nice mix of people who are super into JavaScript, people who are super into web design. It's like a mix of really awesome people. But yeah, go check that out. Wow, Artifact Con first ran in 2013 and it got you guys your first jobs. I'm feeling real old right now. <laughs> you still have a lot more hair than me, though, K-Ball, so <laughs> feel good about that. It, it is turning gray, but I don't know if you can see that over Skype, but yeah. Cool. How about you, Nick? What are your recommendations? Cool. Yeah, so um, I went with some cool vanilla JS uh, APIs, and more specifically, most of them are, are tied to the browser, not uh, JavaScript itself, so they won't be in like Node. Uh, but I was the first one I was going to say was Fetch, but Chris said uh, that he wasn't a fan, so... No, I'm not you, so sure. You can like your own thing, Nick. That's fine. Fetch <laughs> yeah. has a lot of upside. I, just, I like it a lot. Uh, and that's that's a promise-based API, and I really like that promises are just built into the browser now. Uh, so that's that's a, a really nice feature, and now we're getting new newer APIs like Fetch that are uh, promise-based, so it makes it really easy to use with like async await, and it's just such a joy to use compared to the old callback hell. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that. And then, uh, two quick, uh, APIs are URL search params. That's something that I've, I've written things to parse the, the query params in a, in a URL of my own, like several times in several projects. It's just built into the browser. So you can just use that now, which is really great. Uh, and then the final one is form, the form data API. Uh, and this is really great because it will take a form element. You can pass a form element to it. It will grab all of the form fields in that form. And then you have this object that you can just immediately send up. Uh, and I specifically use this on forms where I also have files like images or PDF files or whatever you want to upload uh, that you want to send up as well. Uh, this is the way that you can do that without having to do that crazy uh, post in an iframe trick or um, or anything else. You can just do it. Yeah, yeah. It's really nice, really nice and, and uh, simple to use. So, yeah. To, uh, those are just a couple of things that are just built in and ready to go uh, in any project that you need. All right, thanks. With that, let's actually bring this to an end. So thanks again to our guest, Chris Ferdinandi. You can check him out at gomakethings.com. has links to all his stuff. Um, or he's on Twitter. Um, what's your Twitter handle? Chris Ferdinandi. Um, it's terrible to spell. So go to gomakethings.com and jump over there. Go to gomakethings and then you can find him from there on Twitter if you want to follow him on Twitter. I hear he argues with people. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Divya. Thank you, Nick. Uh, this closes out our episode for this week. All the different resources and things that we talked about will be in the show notes down below. Um, I do want to make a quick shout out to listening live and tapping in with us. I know it's put in the generic stuff at the end. They uh, Adam will tell you about it, but um, it really does make for a lot of fun when you can interact with us and we can have more of a, a back and forth conversation. You come to the Slack channel and chat with us. Um, had a couple people coming in today and I'll shout them out. Mark Reeder and Rusbe Serafia, which I, Rusbe, I'm sorry, I totally butchered your name, but uh, they were chatting with us a little bit in there. Um, you, that could be you and you could be shouted out on JS Party. So come join us uh, every Thursday, 10 o'clock Pacific, 12 Central, 1 p.m. Eastern Time and chat with us live as we go. There's often little snippets and uh, you know fun stuff that you don't get to hear on the recorded episode. If you um, listen live, you'll get to hear what we're talking about during our breaks and all of that fun stuff. The live listeners are what make th makes this a party. That, that you, exactly. Those of you, you who are out there right now, Mark and Rusbe, you are making a, a party for us right now. And so with that, let's wrap up this party. Time to get going. Grab your coffee and your water and let's check it on out of here. So take care y'all and we'll catch you next week. All right. Thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor. Share this show with a friend. We're just have a podcast. Go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things around here at ChangeLaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Linode cloud servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLaw. Check them out and support this show. 
Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder, and you can find more shows just like this at changelaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.